So there's there's obviously the superstars that star. Then there's the people that know them that actually talk on the show. And I am down in the research <laughs> level. The bar- <laughs> Mickey Hart here. You're listening to GAR Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. So I got a phone call about two weeks ago and it was a fella that works with Lake Gale. And uh, hello, whatever, and my name is whatever from Lake Gale, and I, my start, heart started beating and I was thinking in my head, Jesus, I didn't, think, time. I didn't think I was at that level. This is an, <laughs> this is an absolute huge honour. And then next to, I just want to ask you a few questions about Alan Brogan. <laughs> I was like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so then then I was thinking, all oh, right, this is great. Because like, I mean, OK, I'm not going to be the star of the show, but maybe I might get on it to talk about him. There was no question I'm even getting on the show. <laughs> so I'm just giving, I'm basically researching the show. and giving it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's obviously the superstars that star. Then there's the people that know them that actually talk on the show. And I am down in the research <laughs> level. The bar- <laughs> <laughs> I just gave him loads of information about your career. Thanks very much. And that was my job done. So tell us about this. Has this been a bit in the, in the planning, Alan? Ah, they, 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 uh, they called me last year and asked me to do it. And I don't know, for some reason, I just I didn't do it last year. And they were on again this year. So, so. Look, it's a nice show. It's it, it's ah yeah, um, everybody likes that show. Like it's it's kind of some of them are light heart. Like I don't have much of a like some of them kind of have a have a background to the story in them. But but like kind of my story is 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 like is mostly about football. There's no there's nothing that happened in my life that that I've had a pretty a pretty easy life to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, look, so I'm they don't have that to, human interest angle. Yeah, there's not there's not like kind of some of the stories that go for that. But I don't I don't really have that. So like I don't yeah. have any. Any hard luck story. Well, I told him about. Uh, so I hope you didn't tell him too much. Well, I told him. <laughs> a, I told him about um, yourself and Pillar running off to Spain whenever you'd lose in the big matches in Crow Park because you've both got houses out there. He says you should get Pillar on there now. They'll be able to talk. You used to have to hide out in Spain. Hide out, hide, yeah, yeah, that's true. Hide out in Marbella. Yeah. <laughs> Marbella is that where the house? Yeah, I think that's par for the course. Whenever you lose in the championship, you just get out. Get of out of as quickly as well, you can. I, I swear to God, who was it I was talking to recently? I was uh, John Myler. Uh, not just John Myler, but nearly any manager or player that you talk to after losing a match, any chance, and you don't feel good about, it. no, I'm just over in Portugal they're here, or I'm yes. just, <laughs> they're out. <laughs> <laughs> Especially managers, they have to get the hell out of that. Yeah, that's funny, a fellow in work was telling me he was away on holidays there and he met seven or eight of the Dublin hurlers over there, so obviously when they, when they were beaten by Leash, they took the straight yeah. onto a flight and down to Spain as well. Down to yeah. Spain. So when can we expect this just to finish up? When's this uh, Lake Lake? It's not next year. It's not oh, it's not next year. Yet, and yeah, it's a full so. hour as well, isn't it? Because they've, they've yeah, stretched them out. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, ah, look, it'll be interesting. It'll be good for, good for the family and good for the kids to look back on in years to come. So I'm looking forward to it, yeah. yeah. Will, yeah. I'm surprised, Will, you didn't go with the Sigerson Cup angle and be like, oh, you should get somebody from the Sigerson Cup team on there. <laughs> you know? And then they'll be like, do you have Marco Shea's number? <laughs> 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 so at that stage, Will, you couldn't get his game with the Sigerson Cup team. Do not say that. There'll be people listening only too happy to hear that and that's not true I'm not entertaining you oh no didn't I get sent off one year your father had to give me the pep talk I had to give him a talk on the hill in the <laughs> yeah yeah I, why did he start to tell I don't know what the pep talk was about but he thought I needed to be talked to anyways yeah, I think you were after a couple of summers in America maybe your inter-county career wasn't going the way it should have been at the time <laughs> you got back on track shortly after I was letting it? the frustration boil over on yeah, the field yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay right fair enough so come here I want to ask you about Kieran Archer here because this, this fella's outrageous. So I saw him in the Leinster final. Um, and this one's to you, Conan, because I'm sure you've seen the clips. Like his goal against Galway, I saw him against Leash and he carries himself very confidently and there's a little bit of kind of almost Dublin cockiness that I don't know if Jim Gavin might like. It's just the way he kind of carries himself. He's, he knows he's good. That's how I would describe him. Um, in four games so far this year in Junior 21, he scored 3-8, 1-8, 3-8 and 2-5. And I, I, it says 2-5 here. I thought it was 2-6. And this is against Galway in an All-Ireland semi-final. And it's not like they hammered Galway. They did in the end, but Galway got right back into it. Mm. His first goal, he's two men in front of him. There's no goal on. Like, recycle that and throw it out. He threw a sidestep, stepped in between the two of them and roofed it into the, into the top corner of the net. Like, for me, this lad looks like a phenomenon. Is this... Is he... Like being talked about in Dublin circles or what's going on here? Yeah, to be honest, I wouldn't know him that well. And I've spoken to a couple of guys over the um over the last week or so after seeing his after seeing the score he's getting and like he plays with St. Moore's out in Russia in in, in County Dublin. Obviously being on the under twenties he hasn't had exposure at, at at Dublin senior level now, but I'm sure with scores like that he will soon. But like you're right, I've only seen really what what's been online of him and, and 
Like he looks like a like he looks like a fella every every time he gets the ball, he just he wants to go for goal. He yeah. wants to get a goal and um like I suppose like under twenties, I played one all Ireland under twenty one, like and I ne- like like to score three goals in a couple of games a year is a phenomenal scorer. Like yeah. it just didn't like it just didn't happen. I know the senior guys are gone from under under twenty or under twenty one now, the guys playing senior inter county, but it's um it's amazing. I'm sure we'll see him we'll see him with Dublin next year and like I suppose uh, like at under twenty level now, it's probably a different game to senior because senior inter county football now is so measured. You're not maybe getting those same opportunities at senior level now. But hopefully he keeps playing like that because if he does, he's 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 going to be a serious asset to Dublin. Yeah, senior, he definitely will. And then then you wonder, Conan, if he was that good, why is he playing under twenty? Because all the good under twenties are playing senior <laughs> now. It, obviously, Dublin have so many players. Yeah, well, they, like Dublin have Dermot Connolly and Bernard Brogan as backup at the minute. Like you know, it's a hard sort of system to break into. And yeah, true. It's not like he's doing well at under twenties. Like look at the scores that you just picked a three eight. Like you know, ah, stop. three eight in a season up. would be good scoring. Like I mean, <laughs> yeah. <it is. laughs> that's it. Like and like obviously Derry aren't going well at the minute. So I start looking under twenties, under seventeens, and there's a couple of boys that are going well, and I'm thinking, geez, in a few years' time, Derry will have a good, good wee team, and then this boy's coming along and bang three eight. There's nobody in Derry doing that, like yeah, you know. Yeah. So that's there's, not yeah. there's nobody anywhere doing it. No, I do. I do take your point with the under twenty. It's gone so skewed, and it's a bit of a nonsense competition now. In that, Leash beat Mead in the semi final before Dublin. Now Leash, I thought, put it up to Dublin. The goals separated the teams. Leash had yeah. a good team, but they hammered Mead. And then I was wondering, like Mead have been really good at underage. So how have Leash hammered them? And then I realised that Connellan and Walsh and all these lads are in on the seniors. So yeah. That's not Mead's yeah. first it, team. Yeah, it you is know? hard to know what I, level it's a silly, like, It's yeah. a silly competition yeah, yeah. now, realistically, isn't yeah. it? What's the point like for of me, it? Under twenty one was a great competition. Yeah. We played Tyrone in in an All Ireland All Ireland final in 2000, 2003 um, and like they did Sean Cavanagh they did four or five inter like not season at that stage but they were nearly regulars at that stage we three or four in our team and it was it was a huge game whereas now it's with the senior guys gone I don't think it carries the same weight so it's hard to like it's hard to know exactly what level it's at what, exactly what level he's playing at especially if you're playing as you said if you're playing against a Mead and they four or five under twenties gone with the seniors then like, it works against like that you yeah. so, you're ac- you're ac- so in actual fact Leash had been knocked out before Mead so Leash got their two seniors, Mark Barry and Young O'Flynn, back. So Leash had all their, their team plus the two seniors, and Mead were still down their seniors. Yeah. So that's not like fair. That's Jim absolutely Gavin's not fair. In the, Jim Gavin's probably in the situation where he can say, OK, there's Kieran Archer, yeah, he's coming, he's going to be a good player, but I don't really need him this year. So I leave him at under 20, he can play at that level. Whereas somebody yeah. like a Mead or a Leash, if there's someone showing a bit of promise at under 20, they yeah. need to bring them up to the seniors to see can they cut it at that level. I agree. Yeah, Derek Hanavan's playing under down. under 20 as well. So Tyrone yeah. have let him back to them or whatever like that. But it, it, I think it's completely devalued that competition. And I take your point. I loved under... Players yeah. love under 21. It's a good gap to bridge. And if it's just been played off with half teams and like look Kerry have won five minors in a row and they haven't won an under 21 because all their good lads have been t- playing senior yeah. that's nonsense then what's the point of it yeah, I the don't great thing about 21 for me is you're playing with lads you might have played minor with so you're getting to play with these guys for four or five years in the trot whereas when you go into a senior team you're playing with a guy that might be might be 20 or n- 29 or 30 or so you're playing with your group of friends and that's really the last opportunity you get to do that because once you go into a senior panel the, the, like the age group is so, yeah, so yeah. vast that yeah. Uh, it gets yeah. it gets diluted. Yeah. So I saw a tweet from you there during the week. It says, "Watch Dublin Tyrone games in 2008 and 2011. Complete role reversals, but a joy to both a joy to watch. Anyone to spare a couple of hours should watch an unbelievable Tyrone performance in 08 and equally from Dublin in 11." Um, you're right. Like I mean, you were playing in both of those games, and the 2008 game shocked everyone because you were favourites going into that, which is a weird one considering the Tyrone team because you'd hammered your way through mm. Leinster and then you destroyed Wexford in the final, final yeah. in the Leinster final. And then you were captain that year. I'm sure you were having dreams of going up to Hogan stand and maybe that was, you know, a problem with Dublin that, you know, you, you probably had to beat some of these big teams before you'd start thinking of that. But they, geez, they destroyed you on the day. You just couldn't get into it to the point where the crowd were singing easy, easy towards the end of that game. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you, did, you didn't hear that. <laughs> well, I actually went off. I put my hamstring after six minutes. I'd actually been, I'd, I'd, uh, I was working on a Wednesday, and I'd, I'd, I'd been driving somewhere down the country, and I, I drove down and I drove back for training, and I think I didn't give myself enough time to train. But I tweaked my hamstring on the Wednesday even very slightly, and then I went after the first ball, and um, that came into me. I heard him. Hurt me hamstring, stayed on for another three or four minutes, but had to go out. So I was gone after six minutes. Um, not that it would have made any difference result in the end, but yeah, like, like I don't know. In 2008, maybe we'd had it so easy that year up to that stage that that we just 
like we weren't ready when we went down against Tyrone we weren't ready to, to, to maybe come back from that we actually started okay we had a few chances I had a ball off the post Jay who had an easy chance he missed so maybe that unsettled us a little bit then they got a goal uh, Sean Cavanagh got the first yeah. goal I think didn't he yeah he was 17 on steps or something yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like I watched it the other night and my club mate Ross McConnell was marking him and I know exactly if you remember he came in under the Cusick, under the Cusick stand and he got him on the end line and I know watching it back because we'd spoken about it what Ross was trying to do he was marking his right foot because he was mm. waiting for the shimmy back out Sean shimmy back out onto yeah. his right foot um, but I think he just gave him a little bit too much of a gap down the end line he was able to cross him and get a finish and after that we were just we were we were all over the place like it was, yeah. it was actually it was. I watched your 2011 game first and then I said right for a bit of balance I better watch you <laughs> <laughs> so I was, was surprised you watched that game especially number one you went off early and number two you lost what's the point why do you need to watch <laughs> I that game I just needed a bit of balance after <laughs> 2011 but, uh, it, but was, it was car crashed up in the but end I end think end. everybody did underestimate Tyrone that year anyways because it wasn't just Dublin that would have under, under. I don't wouldn't say you underestimated them but uh, you were very hot favourites based on Leinster form where Tyrone people maybe thought this their good team was kind of going and didn't give maybe Tyrone the credit that they deserved yeah was there an element uh, maybe not in the Dublin changing room but Wexford were waiting in the semi-finals well I always remember that year it was like Jesus Dublin Tyrone have a chance to get into a final like you were sort of overlooking as a neutral you were overlooking Wexford thinking whoever wins this is yeah, going to be carrying yeah. the final yeah. I, mean, I don't know if that was playing in the people's minds or not. And in fact, that was an unbelievable Kerry team that coming to that final anyways. Like how yeah. I, I, I didn't give Tyrone a chance in that final. I really didn't. I couldn't believe that yeah, they'd be Kerry that well, year. When I watched Tyrone in that game, like like the confidence come down. Maybe we let them play, but they completely overran us and like did Davy Hart, um Roy Hat back, Philip Jordan left half back and Davy Hart didn't play for too long after that, but in that game he was outstanding. Like he got a goal in the first half. Davy Hart's a very yeah. underrated player. Yeah, when you look back at that player, yeah. at that yeah. Tyrone team, you think of Philip Jordan, you think yeah. of Gormley. Davy Hart's kind of well, at kind yeah. of down the list, but he was unreal. He was. He didn't play for that long for some reason. I don't know what happened to him in the end, but he was. Jeez, he was brilliant that day. And obviously, had McGuigan centre forward, Brian Deer was playing kick and scores for fun. Like and like once they came at you, they just completely overran us and. and we couldn't deal with it at all and th- in the end we were at sixes and sevens like we didn't yeah. like, like so the goal John McMahon got was just came oh, in on his own what a like finish that was though last man. it was a good finish it was yeah, a beautiful finish so. finish so then like I mean th- 2011 again like you said was role reversal so he scored 19 points from play he scored 22 and totally destroyed Tyrone Brian Dewar was off the bench Stephen O'Neill was off the bench you could say that was towards the end of that Tyrone's cycle yeah. But G psychologically had to beat that Tyrone team with those players there, you know, to move on. Yeah, yeah, but I think like we'd beaten him in two thousand and ten on O'Gara got a goal. We beat we beat them by five, I think, but I think I think Tyrone kicked seventeen wides that day. So whilst we, we beat them in two thousand and ten, like it could have went either way. But I think in in, in and in two thousand and ten we'd actually um actually write about this in the Heralds and uh, um, um, uh, it's in tomorrow's Herald but we actually conceded all the kick outs in 2010 really after Mead scoring the five goals against us we went back to Pat Gilroy decided we're just going to we're just going to defend six defenders are not going to cross the halfway line we'll concede the kick outs we'll just meet teams at the seven yard line or at midfield so we can keep the pitch nice and tight so they can't get through us like Mead had to concede five goals so we conceded every kick out in 2010 so right. managed to win it but interesting and that was Brian Cullen and <coughs> Barry Cal were in the forwards then and they were working so yeah. there was a new well, dynamic um, to Dublin wasn't uh, there Catter probably, probably would have been still still wing back in 2010 but in 2011 11 he was centre forward, forward yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and like for me the, the, the All-Ireland final in 2011 was obviously spoken about a lot spoken about a lot the Donegal game was obviously spoken about a lot for obvious reasons but there was never much talk about our performance against um, against Tyrone in the quarter final and for me looking back I'd actually never watched the full game back myself maybe about a week after when we were doing the analysis on it but for me looking back that was certainly the best team performance I was ever involved in in the Dublin shirt and even though only, we only won by seven in the end we were ten up with eight or nine with eight or nine left they got the last three scores and we'd we had four or five really good goal opportunities that we didn't convert. But just when I watched the game, what struck me was like the the, the like our tackling. And I think we'd over 120 tackles that day, which was huge. Like we aimed for 100, we'd over 120. Some of the kick pass, and that's why I said people to watch it back. Like some of the some of our kick passing um, was like was outstanding. And you just don't see it in the game today. Like it yeah. was it was work the ball to midfield, short sharp, one touch hand passing, and then a long kick pass Deliver. delivered into. Oh, I was playing inside it. At times, Dermo obviously kicked seven that day. He was playing inside. Yeah. Berno, I think, kick five from play that day. I think, and there wasn't yeah. a word about it. Like I thought, it was just it was just a phenomenal performance. And and when I talk about the role reversal, Tyrone just cut. They 
they just couldn't live with us that day. And I know they probably were coming to the end, but Brian McGuigan was playing centre forward. You would have thought, yeah, he's coming to the end. But when I watched him at that game, like he was still driving hard. He still had pace. He was still able to take a man on. Stephen O'Neill came on, kicked a few scores. I'm not sure why he didn't start. He must have been coming back from an injury. Brian Dewar maybe was coming to the end of us. Dewar well, well, was coming to the end of his days. But even when he came on, he came on at the start of the might have come on a half time start the second half but even like for a fellow with all his experience even he looked panicked and when you compare it to how he looked kind of three years earlier when he was kicking scores off the outside of his foot and from out on the sideline and stuff it was it was it was just funny to watch the contrast between the two games yeah no it definitely was and the kick pass thing is interesting like I mean the whole idea when you be playing football is maybe use a few hand passes get out of that kind of crowded area now you're into midfield open area now move it on that's the football I always loved but the very next game, Conan, for Dublin was Donegal. They met something they'd never seen before and that changed kicking in Gaelic football forever. forever. It did yeah. Well, look, maybe we're getting yeah. back to it a little bit, but like now the instinct cannot be to play like that kind of football that I love playing and it takes maybe 10 years for you almost to acclimatise to what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that game in, in 11 under, with Donegal. That changed it forever. Because the pressure had gone from one side of the pitch to the other. Yeah, where you were under pressure coming out of the fence, trying to hand pass it out. Yeah. And then suddenly you had all the space you wanted to come out of the fence. And yeah. it was harder to pick a pass because everybody was back in the fence. So if you watch, yeah, I took your advice, Alan, and watched that 2011 game. And it's just these lovely, crisp yeah, passes beautiful. being bounced in, just 50 yards. And it's always you, Bernard, or Dear McConnell's coming out, running onto it. And Tyrone backs are 10 metres behind them, like, you know, because there's so much space. And it's one on one defending, and like you know, I can understand why Donegal didn't want to do that. Same ah, thing yeah. As well. And the funny thing about that was was that <laughs> everybody remembered that Donegal game in 2011. Donegal hadn't played that extreme against yeah. against anyone that year. Mm. That Tyrone game spooked them to yeah, the well point. Yeah, in fairness, that, uh, and like I've only seen the Tyrone game. I'd say when when Jimmy McGuinness and Rory Gallagher watched that and touched, there's no way we can make that sort of <laughs> there. Like what we always tried to do as attackers was, and like for me that day was the day Everett and Pat Gilroy had worked on over the last two years. That's when it all came together and that's when it clicked for us. Um, but when we were defending as forwards, we like we stopped going, if a goalkeeper got a ball or a cornerback got to go, we never pressed them. We always dropped out to the 45 or the 70 yard line. You'd, you'd compress the pitch a little bit right. um, so they couldn't run through you and, and, and then we'd meet them there. And you probably noticed like the amount of tackling that was going on around, yeah. on around the middle of the field, like hard tackling, turnovers on both sides um, was something you just don't see now because players have a lot more space out around the middle of the field because because teams have dropped back it was, uh, yeah, it was great to watch yeah. I enjoyed it anyway yeah, yeah. no it definitely oh, it was great <laughs> yeah. love seeing their own losing we <laughs> talked about uh, Connolly scoring 7 from play that day in 2011 now Paul Curran's writing in the in the Herald um, that's two mentions for the Herald um, here today you <laughs> might get another one in Alan happy, yeah. <laughs> so he says this is an ideal game to start Dear McConnelly I think it's in the Herald anyway I read it on the Independence yeah, website so, yeah. I think this is an ideal game to start Dear McConnelly the talk is that he's flying in training matches but matches are harder than training games so this game will give us a definite answer into how he's moving he needs a start I made a statement here uh, a few weeks ago when this came out Dear McConnelly will not start against Throne he will not play against Throne Dear McConnelly won't play at all this year and well, I'd like to know your thoughts on this because I even know you from 2015 who'd never left the Dublin panel who'd been in there the whole time who's bloody a former player of the year who's committed his life to Dublin Jim Gavin didn't use uh, didn't use you as much as I thought he should have that year I'm How not Dermot Connolly though well, but, <laughs> well listen I'd argue you did more for Dublin than Dermot Connolly did no. like I mean you, you'll be too modest to, to agree with that but you, you had Dear McConnelly, let's let's just break this down without saying you like you're obviously out of the camp. How can he? He'd be in America if it was up to him. Jim Gavin's not going to start playing him ahead of fellas that have been playing, or will he? Will he overlook all that and go if he's something to offer? I have to play him. Yeah, well, like the interesting thing is interesting to to see Paul Curran say he's flying and training because. I can't, even get, I can't <laughs> even get a bit of information out of my own brother, so I'd love to know where Paul is getting it. But. Uh, I'm sure he is flying and training, but like, like I'd be surprised. Which has obviously been lots of conversation there over the last over the last few months, and obviously when 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 Dermot didn't go to states and he came home, it was obviously further conversation. And and, and look, Jim can't guarantee Dermot anything, and I know he wouldn't guarantee anything. But I don't think he'd bring him back. I I don't think he'd take the risk of upsetting other guys bringing him back if he wasn't going to use him. Um, really. Yeah, look, it's hard to say. But like, it's like it's very difficult to say. But it's so hard. Unless it's Dermot so came hard back to, to say, "I want to come back now," and like, 
I think it's with a view to next year. I don't think Jim Gavin can accept someone back in that has walked away, that has not been asked several times to go back in, has said no, then has tried to get to America. When that fell through, he goes in. I don't think that's acceptable. I think this is with, with a view to next year, potentially, yeah. and re- well, reintegrating. I did think him. it was strange. I thought it was late in the day for him to come back. Um, I thought it was maybe a bit too far on in the season. But like, the, 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 like as far as upsetting other guys go, I don't like... There's a lot of guys in that group around a long time. They're they're very close personal friends. I don't think anyone's going to get annoyed with Derma coming back and like if they need to use him in a game to get Dublin across the line, then 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 if they have to do it, he's just so too good to but, leave on the bench. So train, I, I think well he will in use training, him this weekend. Do you? Yeah, I think he will. I think if he's, I don't think he'll start him. Um, I don't think he'll start him in any game, but. Like I think if he is going to use him in a semi final or final, well, here's then he, the needs thing. To, then Here, he needs to use him this weekend. Well, here's the thing. That's what they thought. He came back from the he came back from the suspension. Jim Gavin defended him like nobody else. Really had his back with that and came back from the suspension. Played Tyrone. He got thirty seconds. So who's to say? And that's with him been in the whole time training away or whatever. Why is yeah. he going to get? The other why team, is he going to get the, more than that? Against Tyrone this weekend, even though it's a dead rubber, when he has hasn't he hasn't been there in two years. Yeah, like the the other factor of play is maybe like like a strength of this Dublin team over the last five, six, seven, eight years has been the quality coming off the bench and the impact coming off the bench. Um, and if we're honest about it, they probably haven't got the same impact. It might drop a little bit. They yeah. had that they had in previous years. So maybe so maybe Jim's thinking, look, just in case, I need a guy like this on the bench that I that can come in and make a difference and like that could be a factor of play in bringing him back so late as well but look it's all here say we don't we don't really know sure. but I'd be surprised if he's brought him back and he's not going to use him at some stage right okay. yeah sh- surely the, the conversations of boys maybe being upset have already been had though like it's Jeremy Connolly you're bringing in it's not like just some other player so people know when Jeremy Connolly's in the squad there's a chance that he's going to be ahead of me because it's him yeah, well, so look, he's not a stranger yeah. coming back like, no he's, he's not a stranger for, like, but they've done a lot of minutes, work so. all year like I mean you can, like, this is very late in the day this is in just in the Super 8s they, look what commitment they have given the whole year that he has not Yeah, it's yeah, not right it is a factor, like, it is oh, a factor. Yeah, and I, don't, I know he's I their friend late, he's their friend but at the same time like I mean this mm. is cutthroat it's hard to get in at 26 in Dublin and you're telling me that ok privately there's definitely players going to be going well that's a bit bullshit now yeah, right? someone's going to drop out like it's going to be like Bernard was in the squad the last day back in the squad for the first time is it him to lose out now when Derrick yeah. comes back or so you is think it O'Gara you to lose out when Bernard you think if back, Bernard so. lost out on the 26th on all our final day for Dear McConnelly he wouldn't privately be going ah, for, you know what I mean after I everything I did you would of course like, no I mean, about it, whether yeah, you'd yeah. bring it into the wouldn't um, Bernard would be too good a teammate yeah. to bring it into the group but you'd be you would be livid yourself yeah. of course but you that's, would. that's what I'm wondering like would they not have had has a group had that conversation like knowing that when Jamie comes in there's a chance he's going to take somebody's place so let's have the talk now is anybody going to be upset by bringing him in I think yeah. Jim might have asked him would he Alan he, well, like they, they played they played they, like it was announced the morning after they played oh it was f- after a big game the yeah, first yeah. Super 8 game so like, I'd be surprised maybe he spoke to some of the senior guys but I'd be surprised if that that was brought up like in a group set in the week before that game, yeah, yeah. the week of a match, like it'd just be too much of a distraction. The week of the game, it was, oh, the, it was before the court game, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he just dropped it in on it Dublin TV. The morning, I it, was just <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. It was pure Jim, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he was hoping no one had noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just dropped it in, and he's back, and he's back, and dear McConnell's back training, and he'd be back. Johnny like, Cooper's oh, going oh, Sorry, rewind that there. What? Yeah, and Johnny it was, done, Coop- it was funny. It was done on Dove TV as well, so that there was no questions. Oh yeah, yeah no follow up questions. But yeah, listen, it's it's it's. Uh, oh yeah we know how Dublin work like they leave nothing to chance like that but it, it look it'll be interesting I'm sticking to my guns despite what uh, you say even though you know a lot more about you know the Dublin setup and Dear McConnell and any of them than me so if you're listening I would maybe be smart to go with Alan's opinion but I'm, <laughs> I, I'm too ticked to go back on what yeah, I said I don't yeah. think he'd get an, an to be minute. honest I've no insight into it either like I'm only going on what I think maybe Jim might do Kind of known Dermot's personality. The, the, like it's so late in the it's so late in the year. Why risk bringing him back if he's not going to use him at this stage of the year? Because it, it, like it was a bit of a, like I know it's gone. It's dealt with now and he's back. But like it was big news at the time. Yeah. I suppose. Did they have a good relationship, Jim and Dermot? Did they, as, yeah. as much as you can with Jim, yeah. I suppose. Who's well, Dermot was vice captain. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so it was good. And like I don't know. I'd say like he is a special talent. There's no doubt about it. And like if there was one guy. Jim might make the exception for it. It's probably if I was to pick one, it's probably Derma. Right. Um, like I think anyone else probably 
Probably Jim wouldn't have entertained the notion of bringing him back. Okay. That late in the day, but uh, look, he's back now. And that's yeah. it. I, I hope we see him at some stage because it would like it'll add an extra bit of spark to any game that he comes into as well. And like it'd be great to see him coming off the bench at the weekend. Well, it would as long as well, Eric Lowndes might come off the bench and the hill might start <laughs> cheering him. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Declan Bonner has been given out about <coughs> Sky. So, uh, to be honest, you can see where he's coming from. So, he says, a match of this magnitude. So, the Donegal-Mayo match, which we're not covering today. I'm sorry for, y- for you for you all. We're covering that tomorrow night in Westport. Um, and it's actually the only interesting game uh, this weekend. So, bear with us anyways. <laughs> this podcast will be great. So, Bonner, the match, the Donegal-Mayo match, um, I'm going to it, so I don't really mind. It's on Sky. He said, a match of that magnitude, you want to see it on RTE. There's no doubt about that. I've been visiting people in nursing homes and hospitals over the last couple of weeks and they don't have it on Sky. They'd like to see the game. They don't have the option now. It's not ideal. There's a huge audience out there who want to see the game on Saturday evening. You'd have to agree with him. It's it's unusual to have the very biggest game of the weekend on Sky. And I completely take his point of all those people in nursing homes and stuff like that that don't get to see the game. It, the, the light the light is shone on it more when it's a game like this because they've been getting away with it having the lower profile ones on the Saturday evening and then RT having the bigger ones on the Sunday was it pre-arranged or is this the one it seems Sky? that Sky have Saturday and yeah. Yeah. RT have Sunday I think Sky got the first pick for the qualifiers and I think it's probably just down to the fact that RT were going after the Monster Hurling Championship at the start of the year so they got the first pick for those yeah. yeah like it is it is a big game not to be like not to be shown because the rest, even though it will be interesting, like it's up in Toronto and stuff, but but it's like it's the one big game that everyone everyone would pitch their weekend around. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the. I don't have like, I don't have Sky at home. Do you not have no, Sky? No. no, right. Um, so I'll have to go somewhere else to watch. You'll have to go to a pub or something. <laughs> and, and watch I'll send it. you a link, Alan. <laughs> 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 but that, but that's the thing, and yeah, but the way I look at it is, and like this is without a, a doubt, and this isn't any anti Sky thing. There's elderly people all throughout. Donegal whose routine would be to pull up a chair um, in front of the television whenever Donegal would be playing and support them and they might be a bit too old to go to a match they could be in rural Donegal where they're not even close to someone to go watch it or a pub or whatever and they can't get to watch I don't think that's good enough that they can't get to watch that they can't get to watch their own county when that's what they've been doing all their life um, for yeah, me, like, I think that's like very. It's a harsh. conversation that's got that's kind of got a little bit boring at this stage, but it's obviously reared its head again with yeah with uh, with this game at the weekend. And I suppose, like for me, I've used the GA Go thing abroad, and it's a great service to be able to watch online abroad. So, I suppose, like, like for me, that stops uh, this kind of whole thing of Sky being for the expats. Yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't stack up for me because no. of GA Go now. So, I th- ah, look, I think it'll be looked at again once it comes up again. I, th- I think revert back I to something else. Revert yeah. back to Virgin Media, but Sky are pumping in millions into grassroots. <laughs> so like I mean money talks too you wonder why the, you know like I mean it, yeah. it, look it's hard to know uh, this isn't a show to be talking you know, about this of, anyways the likes of Virgin as well will come with, with some deep pockets as well they're probably the one that might be able to compete with Sky in that regard yeah so and they're free to air so no one would have any problem yeah. with that like I mean that so would be that, yeah so Bonner has been talking as well about the the one week turnaround to the semi-final now even Fitzmaurice was complaining about the the schedule of the Super 8s I don't really agree with that. I think two games in a row and then a two week break and a one game is not the worst. It's not yeah. like it's doable. But the the week turnaround to the semi final is outrageous. So yeah, so now Donegal play Tyrone or Dublin Donegal or Dublin play Tyrone and there are going to be two B teams. We'll talk about that in part two because it's a six day turnaround. Like how would you even justify playing lads? You know? And then you have Kerry who play Mead. Who might go a few points up, then start taking everybody, everybody off? Yeah, like I mean, the six-day turnaround after the f- three games in four weeks. How can anyone stand over that? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's like even for guys that have played, to expect guys to turn around in six days, and um, haven't played, and it's not just the six days. Like they played four or five games in in four games in five weeks. Well, now Mayo and Tyrone so. have played seven yeah. in seven. Will have played seven and eight. Yeah, the likes of Donegal, likes of Donegal Mayo have to put everything on the line next weekend. Whereas the likes of Dublin and Tyrone, they can't afford if they have a couple, if they have a couple of guys carrying knocks over last, which at this stage there will be guys carrying ankle injuries and stuff over the course of the last few weeks. Just leave them out, give them an extra week to recover. The likes of James McCarthy is his knee right? Like why bother playing him in a match like that? Just give him an extra week and he'll be yeah. fine for the following weekend. Whereas for 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 um, Mayo and Donegal, everything goes on the line. And everything goes on the line, and Kerry as well ha- can't afford not to play all their team. You know because. The, 
they don't want to be in a four way play a three way playoff yeah. so they have to win that game they can't go out but Bonner said these are amateur sportsmen playing at a high level and it takes time to recover a lot of them are back to work late on Sunday evening and go to work again on Monday morning we need a two week gap for the winners on Saturday night there's only seven days for a semi-final nothing needs to be looked nothing needs to be looked at because they have to recharge again so that's it so you know after any big championship match Alan by the time you go back to training on Tuesday things are taken nice and easy and you're only it'd be Thursday nearly before you're looking yeah, you're, especially Thursday, matches at all of magnitude so basically you're you're starting to get your mind focused for an all earned semi-final on the Wednesday or Thursday yeah, Christ yeah. almighty an all earned semi-final yeah. you know, and even the lead into it from from a like from a media perspective yeah, yeah. all that and and, and showcasing the games and even for even for families travelling to games like if you're a Mayo support and all of a sudden you've done f four or five games in five weeks like it's it's, uh, like, yeah. it's a, like it's a big burden to put on players it's a big burden to put on supporters um, you might need to let it go into the next month's pay before you start going <laughs> to another <Yeah. laughs> start going to it's true though yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it is. and it is it's just less of a buzz because there isn't an opportunity for the media to yeah. do video pieces or do yeah, long form yeah. features like you did a show down in Wexford before the semi-final there for the hurling look at the buzz down there yeah. Yeah. because you had that proper time to go down and do it but no, it's just six days straight into it. And last year, was it 50,000 for the Tyrone game? Tyrone you know, interestingly enough, now that you say that, I was just looking at that 2011 game. There was only 52,000 at that. How is that? Because that was a must-win game for Dublin against a team traditionally, you know... A, it Maybe wasn't like a Maybe the weather It was raining that day a lot. But I thought, because everybody crows on about Dublin now and the terrible support. But I was very surprised to see only yeah. 50, 52,000 at that game. That now, yeah. Yeah, so an interesting one. Bad news for Leash Lads, John Sugru has, or Shukru, whichever, we've been pulled up on this before. I'm sticking with Sugru. Um, so he stepped down. So this has come as a big surprise to everybody. Um, remember his interview after the Cork game, he was talking about still loads of work for us to do, you know, which didn't, absolutely didn't make anybody think that he was thinking of stepping down. It's a huge loss to Leash. He's obviously... Um, nobody wanted a job when he took over he's got us two promotions he's got us into a Leinster final and he's got us into the last 12 in two years and as for Leash at the level we're at now it's a phenomenal achievement so like I mean obviously we don't know his reasons yet and it was him that stepped away so it's just a huge blow and for me it's even a bigger blow the fact that we're in Division 2 and it's going to be a really difficult job to stay in Division 2 for Leash and for a new manager to come in while he's going to be trying out a few lads and you know the kind of upheaval a new manager brings that's all right in division four but in division two you really need that continuity you know to continue yeah. on that work so it, it's a big blow yeah he's a big loss and he's highly regarded as well so look it's difficult to know what's going on in the background maybe the maybe the commitment for him maybe the travel commitments that, that you know he that lives in port leash like he port doesn't leash, yeah, yeah and he's a physio uh, business in port leash like i mean yeah, so he maybe he's looked for something to take to the next level and he couldn't get it across the line he wouldn't know what's gone i'm sure it'll come out he wasn't backed in the transfer but market yeah <laughs> but it is strange you go at this stage yeah maybe, maybe he's looked at it and he's thought this is as far as i can take and i'll let someone else have a go at it but it's hard to get like it's hard to get fellas of of, of his sort of quality now especially living in the county yeah um, so it's going to be a challenge for leash to uh to, to to replace him that's for sure. it and like he's young he was hungry he was out to prove himself you know you'd be worried you'll get a manager now that's on the merry-go-round you know these yeah. ones I don't want to start naming them mm. in case I want to ring one of them <laughs> 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 but like I mean ones that maybe wouldn't have that same driver you know maybe have that modern take even though like Sugru, Shukru wasn't without his faults like I mean he stood there looking at uh, at least two man full back line get mauled yeah. against Cork and did nothing for a whole game yeah. so like I mean you won't find any manager after a loss that won't be criticised I suppose at some point was his relationship good with the players oh yeah the, the players liked him and feared him a little bit but respected him yeah. which is a, all the information I got from players was that they really liked him you know and this is a big this is a big blow for them yeah and it, like, they won three championship games both years you know Derry West Meath twice it's not to be sniffed at winning three games in the championship both years taking over the Division 4 team and doing that I wonder there's a lot of jobs coming up because you know he's in line for one of those I think he definitely deserves to be in line for those jobs even Kildare Derry Jesus maybe I never Galway. thought of Kildare don't mention that <laughs> I know Monaghan <laughs> like, like he, is, he is in that bracket now I think he's earned the right to be in that bracket rather than picking yeah. off the merry-go-round yeah. as you say I heard Tom Cribben was in line for the Kildare job and uh, Tom Cribben managed me before I thought he was very good so let's leave Tom Cribben there he <laughs> might bring in because Rory Gallagher stepped down too Rory Gallagher's at the live show in Westport tomorrow night so we're going to have good crack with Rory Rory was doing a lot of trash talking back in 2013 especially 
So he was talking about Mayo colluding with Monaghan to beat Donegal and that Kieran Shanahan used to write, uh, Kieran Shannon used to write James Horan's scripts and all stuff like this. So there's some great, ca- great crack went on between Mayo and Donegal back, back then. But he's stepped down from Fermanagh. I don't know how much of a surprise that is. He's obviously got them to Division 2, got them to an Ulster final, um, beating Monaghan. Ended up losing to Donegal, was it both years who beat Fermanagh this year? Jeez, I should have been thinking of, of this uh, quickly before. It'll come to me anyways when you start talking. Rory Gallagher, anyways, there's talk that he might be taking over Monaghan with uh, Banty McAnini. Wow, the dream team. Yeah, like that's a team I've never put together before, but geez, yeah. yeah. Like, Rory, in fairness to him, I know we've slagged the, the, the football or not using the Quigleys at both times, saying it must be the wrong system if he's not using both of those, but he almost got promoted to Division 1 this year. <laughs> Whatever way he was playing, he almost got there, coming from Division 3, so... Yeah, he's doing all right for himself. To beat Don- Donegal beat him and Ma- they drew Monaghan in the qualifiers. Yeah, I was just talking enough for you to remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you need that. Uh, somebody start talking, let me think. You were looking at me blankly there. Like you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like he knows his football, Roy. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Like he would have played with Bridgets in Dublin. Would have won a championship. Who did he not play else. with? He was worse than me. Yeah. He'd about three different clubs, didn't he? He was with yeah. Galls too. Yes, I went to think Galls. All Ireland with Galls, yeah. yeah. Bridgets and his own club in Fermanagh. And yeah, played with Monaghan Fermanagh. He's did done he the rounds. Yeah, he played. He no, did play with. He played with Cavan. Or no, was that not his Played brother? intercounty. Played intercounty. Definitely with someone other than Fermanagh. Maybe not Monaghan. Go on, anyways. I'm <laughs> talking. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like he's a good track record. Obviously with Jimmy McGuinness and 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 I would have known him from playing with Bridgets and he was living around Blanchetown where I lived at the time. So, um, he um he's definitely a man of conviction in his managerial style and like like the way he plays football. That's the way he plays football. Oh yeah. It. Yeah. And he's done well, like he's got success with it. Like maybe if obviously with Fermani he thought maybe he had limited resources there, so he had to he had to play a certain style. Maybe with it with it with with, with a county further up the chain he might play he might play a bit more football and um he probably has a young family as well. Maybe he might want to break from but it's interesting to see when he's gonna go into Monaghan. There's um, Monaghan and there's Derry popping up, sure. Like I mean I suppose this is a bit there'll be a bit of silly season when the football <laughs> finishes and we'll yeah. talk about all these yeah, well, potential that's available, ones. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, right. Listen, that's it for the start of the show. We'll be back in part two and we'll have a look at all these dead rubbers. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start with Tyrone and Dublin. Obviously, we're just going to get a prediction on the end at the end of Mayo Donegal. It's the most interesting game, but we'll be covering that um, tomorrow night. So Tyrone Dublin is a total dead rubber, unfortunately, because let's be honest. Does finishing first or second mean any difference here? You're talking about Kerry, Donegal, or Mayo. They're all there. I'd see those three teams. I couldn't pick anything yeah, between them. Yeah, it makes them. no odds. Like, you, like if you were Jim Gavin looking and thinking, would I prefer to play? Well, you don't know who you're going to be playing anyway. So because you don't know the outcome of those games. Outcome so so house, it is so a pure dead rubber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know? think he'd have a preference either. I don't think Mickey Hart would have a preference. Um, maybe Mickey Hart might want to avoid Donegal if he could just. But. Uh, yeah, but in saying that, like, like, and you don't go into a game like that, and and certainly the players won't be treating it as a, as a dead rubber. Will he make, like, again, we're speculating? He probably will make some change after carrying a few knocks, but I can't see fifteen new players going in. Can you not? On your Friday team? No, but just we, we've talked about the six day turnaround. How would you not? You don't need to win it. You don't. You want your players fresh. They've played two weeks ago after the Ross Common game so they'll have a, a three week lead into an All-Ireland semi-final would Jim not yeah. be looking at that if three it happens week. if it happens it's the end of the Super 8 if they both play a B For team me, yeah, yeah, yeah. right um, okay but there's no lo- I can't see any logic to playing players that would have to play the following week what if they get injured it's a psychological edge like the guys are fit enough if you don't get, yeah like there's always a risk you get injured if you're two weeks out there's always a risk you get injured and it is a quick turnaround and if someone's carrying a knock as I said, likes of James McCarthy, if he's still feeling the effects of that knee injury, there's a couple of other guys, which probably are. Maybe he'll leave out the really important guys. Maybe he likes a likes a Fenton or something like yeah. that. Yeah, but Johnny Cooper might need a game because he's been out. There is guys that'll need a game. And um, we spoke about his bench. Maybe there's a couple of guys, that, 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 like his bench hasn't performed as well as he would like. Maybe he'll maybe he'll try use a couple of those guys to maybe try get a bit of maybe try get a bit of form going. But I think the whole psychological edge is enough for both teams to 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 maybe go out and give it a good lash. But in terms of individuals, like if you know you're playing six days later, no matter what happens here in All Ireland final, that's going to be in the back of your mind somewhere. Um, so, so I'd imagine if you compare the Dublin Tyrone match to what's going to happen in what's going to happen in Castlebar on Saturday evening, I think it'll be uh, it'll be 
it will be completely different. Oh, it'll be completely different. So Galway last year were through to the semis and they played Monaghan and they played their full team and they lost. And it was like it kind of knocked the momentum out of them or whatever. I think, like, there's talk here that Tyrone psychologically need to beat Dublin. But, like, I mean, are they going to fool themselves if it's not Dublin's full team and it's a dead rubber? Are you going to get much out of that psychologically anyways? Yeah, you need to be asking the crowd not to come, just to play the whole occasion down and then come back next week. Is there anything in players haven't played in two weeks already from the last game they played? Do you need to get a wee bit of a run out before the semi-final? Yeah, that's true. You get to a semi final, then they haven't played in the haven't played in the month. Weeks, yeah. it's, no, three weeks. Yeah. Three it would be three weeks. Um, I don't know, lads. I jeez, I can't see Jim Gavin risking any of those players. I, I imagine if he played one or two of the big players and they got injured, sure, he'd never forgive himself. It's and they don't need to win it. And I keep stressing this: they don't need to win it. There's a six or seven day turnaround to a semi final, and it makes no difference who they play because the three teams. Like, okay, if this was a Dunny, a Kerry first and a Roscommon second and a Donegal or Dublin will avoid Kerry and, you know, play Roscommon in a semi-final, no disrespect. But there's none of that in this. I think, I just, if you think that'll be the end of Super 8, I couldn't fathom yeah. if one of these teams played their full team or play, play any more than five regulars. <laughs> yeah, and I, and again, I'm just wondering: is there is there value in say Conor Callahan coming up against a packed Tyrone defense and getting used to it? And I know Tyrone might not play exactly that way, and Willie, you were saying that Tyrone will probably throw a dummy system out against Dublin to try and throw them a little bit. Yeah, like I think what happens, even if they did play the two the two full teams, I think what happens what happens in Alma next weekend if Dublin and Tyrone come up against her against each other in All Ireland final, it bears no no resemblance to what will happen in all Ireland final because I think Tyrone will play a different way I mm. think in a tighter field of Bonoma he'll bring his defence back he'll play like that it, I think if they meet Dublin fur, 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 further down the line they'll, they'll um, probably revert to the way he yeah. played against them in the National League in the league, league. yeah yeah. But play be the two lads inside cause that's 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 where they got the joy that day well, they haven't really played like that since yeah. did it, no since they have well, yeah they did they did against Donegal in yeah, Ulster and Donegal, yeah after yeah. Donegal no they haven't until the second half against Cork so then again they're not really fooling anyone there either because Dublin will be well prepared for the two lads inside yeah. and Sludden and Hart so I just see no point in this game <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just toss for it like I'm so, dis- <laughs> I'm so disappointed in that this was like should be the big the big game of the last weekend as results have turned out it's not and because the two of them are true and could, could there's a very good chance they'll play in an all Ireland final. What are, even tactically, what, what can we talk about? Because it's, it's all just going to be bullshit. <laughs> it's hilarious. Like, the funny thing is, I can see Tyrone playing a little bit of silly beggars. I can see them playing in their defensive system. No problem. They won't play that, even though Dublin aren't stupid and they'll know what's coming in an all Ireland final. But at the same time, Dublin will just play their own game. Like, I'd say... What what way would Dublin work it? You know, you hear a lot of managers saying we just a lot of the time we concentrate on ourselves and we look a bit on the opposition. Would Dublin be about ninety percent on their own game and ten percent then on the opposition, or how would they kind of work it? Because we know Dublin, when they play a defensive team, they have that system already locked down, so they know they can go to that. And then if it's a less defensive team, they might, you know, be able to play more of a kicking game. How much? How much can they concentrate on their own? Do they concentrate on their own game or worry about the opposition? Yeah, like Jim would always look at the opposition maybe the week before the game, and then like for the four or five days running in, it would it would, would be all about Dublin. Um, but like and even like it's gonna be hard. Like when you're sitting down to do analysis on Toronto with the lads, it's good, like even from a manager's point of view, it's gonna be hard to convince anyone to go hell for letter at this now. And you just yeah, like if you game six days out, so I think the game. <coughs> Like I think it'll start off okay. Then I think you'll end up seeing a lot of hand passing out around the middle, and kind of guys afraid to commit to to go through tackles and stuff in case of picking but up. But that that'll be the no end doubt. of the super eights then as well. Yeah, you know what I mean? That'll be just a fa- That'll be a farce. But like there'll be a bit of pride as well, and and like I don't think Jim certainly won't disrespect the competition. There's no way he'll make fifteen changes. There's absolutely no way. I know that won't happen. He might if the guys carrying knocks. He might leave them out if he decides that there's one or two really important guys. Maybe the likes of likes of Brian Fenton, maybe the likes of Con Kieran Kenny, someone like that, just maybe leave them out and use them off the bench if he has to. Or if he starts them, he'll whip them off soon enough with, with, with into the second half or whatever to make sure they're fresh for next week. Yeah. But I don't think he'll disrespect the competition by changing the full 15. Here's the thing about uh, playing against Dublin and we saw this in the Leinster final against Mead. So Le- Mead left themselves a little bit open to the kick pass and some kick pass, Dublin, that's Dublin's A game. They, they like to play that. 
and if it's on they'll usually go for it and they forced it a little bit against Mead and then in the second half they obviously got the message and they ran it an awful lot more so here's the question that if you offer up that kick pass to Dublin and then you take it away from Dublin say you offer it up maybe for the first 15 minutes and Dublin are into their kicking game then you drop somebody back and then by the time Dublin have kind of realised shit they have a sweeper back there then you move it it's half time it's half time and then they get the message and they reorganise it and then you give them something else to think about why doesn't that happen because it is it does take you maybe 10 minutes to realise oh well maybe to drop a man back once that intercepts has that is that becoming a trend now and it could be 10 minutes of you intercepting a few balls you know like I, sometimes because I think Dublin it'd be a risky tactic now to give them the kick pass for 15 minutes the game could be over well, after me, 15 me, minutes that's me, the danger me yeah. did though and it didn't because yeah. kick well, passes are obviously I think Dublin are out of practice absolutely in 11 you were every training yeah. session was practicing this I don't think Dublin practice it as much because it's never usually on yeah and, and that's like it's kind of been that's the way guys have been coached now Dublin have been coached to play this measured kind of game so all of a sudden the f- like like for lots of those guys their natural game is the kick pass so that's kind of like because they've been coached to hold on to the ball possession then, then they kind of forget about that a little bit and it's only until maybe they're in a game and they say, oh, there is a bit of space and yeah. they start kicking it again um, and I think like the game has, has definitely evolved like there's more opportunity for the likes of Dublin to kick pass now than there was two or three years ago so I think they need to they do need to revert back to that sort of kick that's a kick passing game a little bit more and they'll get a lot of joy out of it because um, if they can get men one on one inside with defenders like it's a uh, like a fancy Dublin all day long and that sort of game but there's no doubt it has been I wouldn't say coached out of them but it's just been the way Dublin have been coached over the last number of years because of the way teams have set up against yeah, them that's the thing they, like uh, the reason teams hand pass is because it's lower risk than kick passing so my theory it actually works against what we were always taught for the last 10 years I'm saying now to give Dublin the kick because lure they're into it. lure them into yeah. the kick because it's a higher risk and it's much easier to get a, a turnover from a higher risk kick pass than it is tackling them when they just hold on to it and making it you know what I mean they won't give it to you if you hand pass it they might give it to you if you kick pass yeah, it you know yeah. like I mean it, it almost goes against what you know what I mean you were coaching yeah. a defensive team for the last 10 years yeah it's interesting so if you're playing against Dublin you try to encourage them to kick pass it so you might get a turnover because In, they very rarely give the ball away when they're yeah when they're playing yeah. that sort of possession game looking for the gaps in yeah. the defence yeah. I yeah. think that the possession game they have down to, to an art they never give turnovers up from that but we saw against Mead when you give them the kick pass yeah. and you have Tigerish defenders you know and Dublin might not have practised too, too much on this and you see it against, Me- against Mayo a lot of the turnovers in those really open games were from brilliant defending from kick passes That's coming right. in and that was the end to end stuff because both teams wanted to play that and Mayo took mm. them on at a you know both teams got men behind the ball but predominantly they were looking for kick passes inside yeah, as the well. fir- but the further the pass is the more opportunity for the defender to maybe get a hand in or to get out and exactly to exactly make the forward spill it or whatever but especially uh, yeah, if there's a big gap um, it's an interesting so leave yeah. the three so leave the three full backs one on one with the three double forwards leave and the kick it in and see can you <laughs> 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 the let them mark from the front and leave a big gap there let them mark from the front no forward likes a big gap and being marked from the front yeah. I'm telling you sure, that's what the Dublin backs do anyway they, they mark from the front when there's a huge gap you know what I mean uh, between the half forward line if they're dropping too many men back and do, if Dublin end up mar- dropping too many men back leaving two up, up front I'd leave nobody in front of them I'd let that kick because by the time they gather it they'll be way out anyway you know what I mean? Man, you might win it on the half or on the forty-five or whatever, yeah, and you'll have men. That, yeah. You'll have men back then. I wonder um, were those like three or four big high balls into O'Callaghan against Ross Common? Oh yeah. Probably thinking there were people marking from the front. You can't mark from the front. They're going to boom balls in like yeah. that. So what did you think? You. What yeah. did you think of that? Did you think that? Because it was actually uh, Paul Early said in the Sky co- co- commentary, and I've I've watched Dublin's warm up a lot. And it's very, it usually follows the same routine. But he said in that warm up, I wasn't at this game, that they were kicking it in over overhead. And I hadn't seen Dublin doing that in a warm up yeah. before. And then they start giving those balls to Con. This is a clear new yeah, well thing. Those, yeah, those crossfield balls are where they're, they're, I suppose they're high risk, high reward. If you get them into the forward's hands, you could be in on goal. But again, like it's easy for defenders sometimes to snuff them out. But yeah, look, maybe they've noticed that there's a bit more space and their teams are leaving leaving a little bit more space and there's opportunity to kick pass because it has nearly gone out of the game over the last couple of years. Like, like if you look at that 2011 game and now we're coming back to it, I said there's more kick pass in that game than I've seen in in in, in full championships in the last four or five years. Yeah. Um. So look, it's, look, it'd be great. I think if like if Dublin can start kick passing a lot more, then then it's going to be to their advantage. And Did you know Con was as good in the air as that? Um. He's very powerful. Like like he's he's. 
like I think he has a gym out the back in his house so really? yeah like he's been coming up the, like he's a strong man even though he looks quite small in stature like he's like he's very well built he's um, and he's strong yeah, like he's a ball winner that's 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 his main attribute for me he can obviously score as well but like his ball winning abilities are fantastic right from an early age you could see that in him right um, ball winning over I, see I was a ball winner but I couldn't catch it over my head well I didn't realise he had that <laughs> like I could get out in front and win yeah, ball yeah, yeah. But like you were a ball winner and you're like you know what I mean. Not Most, over my head though. Not <laughs> over your head either. So Con, I didn't know Con could could do that. Yeah, now he is. Well, he'd be a lot, he'd be a lot broader than me. You know, will he? But, yeah. Uh, but this year he's the head shaved and he looks like he's like I don't know. It's like jeez, oh, I don't want to say what is on in my head. It's like I was going to say it's like he's come back from a ten year stretch in jail or yeah. something and now he's just been pumping <laughs> weights in in you know like in a movie. Yeah, well, if, uh, cold blood a killer. Yeah, right? now yeah. he's back yeah. as this. Like he this sort of. <laughs> There was this sort of perception that he was a nice footballer and a nice young lad and stuff. Maybe he shaved the head to change his perception. <laughs> but, no, he's not, but he does look like, like yeah. he looks. He, he looks tough. a lot tougher now. Yeah. He's obviously he's going well at the. He's going hard at the gym because he is like he's like he's so well built and like that score he got where he won it out front and looked like he snapped his cruise on the way down. <laughs> I'm not, that's as good a score as I've <laughs> ever seen, yeah. ever ever yeah. seen. Because that was just and he had a free there all day long, but he wasn't he wasn't happy with that. He, he wanted to get up yeah. and and the way he scores points. They all just land over the bar. He passes them over the bar. Yeah. That's the Stevie McDonald advice we got here. You should have got that sometimes because your shooting could be a bit wild at times. <laughs> he said he, he gave us this advice and I thought it was good advice. Um, he said, pretend someone's standing on the crossbar and you're passing it to them because he's he, in his head. You'll very rarely kick a pass that's not to a man's chest. But when you're kicking at the goals, you're a bit. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. imagine that you're kicking yeah. it into that man's chest. Yeah, the one what I a use brilliant is, piece yeah, of advice. The one I use with the kids is just put a bin in behind the goal and just try to drop it into the oh, bin. Oh, that's, that's good. How are you yeah. going to put it's it in the, the bin? So that's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I should have listened to it myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I only learned to advise later in my career. <laughs> uh, but Stevie also told us to just blast the ball when you're a one on one, and no. that doesn't work. No, that, that doesn't, doesn't work. work. That was bad advice from Stevie. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I didn't agree with that. He he was Stevie, and he was a brilliant finisher. He said when he was one on one the goalie he always just blasted it and he, he said it worked out better <laughs> if he worked it out better if it actually came off your boot a bit wrong you know like Mulligan on Cluxton <laughs> yeah, that year yeah, yeah, like yeah. It actually, the keeper can't read it because when yeah, I yeah. blast it I blast it I punt it straight yeah. at the goalie and he parries it out <laughs> yeah. so that blasting it doesn't work for me yeah, more accurate than you've ever been just straight at the keeper's <laughs> chest <laughs> I think I remember Stevie rolling a few into the corners now yeah. let's have a look maybe from an angle he's yeah. talking about I don't know <laughs> I, I remember talking to Keon Ward about it because I missed a couple off Stevie's advice I'm like, I can't, can't score one on one. And he, I, I said, Stevie told me to blast it. And he goes, Well, just pick a point and blast it at that point. And I was like, Oh, that makes more sense. Like, you know? But you know, when you blast it, I miss lots of goals. I actually missed one in that Toronto game as well. I came in from the angle on the left and I blasted with my right foot, but it skewed a little bit off my right. Uh, off the edge of my right foot and went riding wide on the right post but so like some Mossy Quinn when he's coming in from yeah. an like that he just slides it in under the keeper off his yeah. instep like and yeah. um, I think Mossy would give you different advice than that now his like his finish uh, Mossy plays it yeah he was like for me Mossy was probably the best finisher I certainly the best finisher I ever played with anyway just with his ability to give a keeper the eyes and roll it in the other side at the instep and Mossy never blasted it it was always rolling yeah. yeah. I mean, it's actually finish. very hard just to just on that is to have like I have great control off the inside of my boot kind of as a soccer shot off the ground but out of your hands it's hard to wrap around it's, you know what I mean you yeah. can get that wrong but Mossy had great control yeah, off the instep of the foot yeah. I think that's a really difficult skill but anyways we'll continue on here lads we won't spend as long on this one Mead Kerry um, Mead are 13 to 2 Kerry are 1 to 10 and the handicap here is 7 I think Kerry will demolish this handicap um, I don't think Mead will be able for that forward line like I mean Jesus and and the, the problem for me is Kerry really they can't take the risk they yeah, can't take yeah. the risk of being in that in that three way like in fairness to me it's been like it's been a good year for them um, even to make the Super 8s and, and they've done alright in the Super 8s as well like I know they were like against Donegal they were they were level with 10 left against Mayo they were winning our level Same. with 15 yeah. left, weren't mm. they? so they've, they've actually performed really well and it's it's only in those last final 10 or 15 minutes maybe when the game has to be won that they've they've kind of fell away maybe it's haven't had the strength of the bench to come in to finish the game off or, but it's their first year at that level and I think whatever happens the weekend I think Andy McNeil will take a lot of positives out of the year um, and even though they were well beaten by Dublin I thought they like they missed a lot day if, like if their shooting had been a bit, mm. little bit better against Dublin it might have been a bit tighter at half time well, they kept Dublin to one was it 117? Um, it was a 117 yeah, no, yeah, I think that's all Dublin four well, to like four yeah, yeah. so yeah. Dublin beat the handicap 
But 117, Jesus, most teams, if they said you're going in to play Dublin and you can see 170, they'd bite their hand off. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, so have, from that point have. of view, they did well against Dublin. Yeah, they have performed well, but I agree with you. I think this weekend is going to be is going to be very difficult for them. Um, like, as you said, the fact is in Navin, maybe they'll rally a performance for that, but going in, going in against Kerry, knowing you're out of the championship, it's from a psychological perspective yeah. for the players, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, they know their season's over. Yeah. They're, they're finished up after this game, yeah, so it's, it's hard. hard. Yeah, and Kerry, do, like, they have to win anyway, so there's something to play for, but... I also think because they hammered Mayo, Kerry know that they can finish top if they just beat this handicap because you'd assume that Donegal and Mayo weren't going to rack up a nine point difference yeah. like yeah. Kerry did. Yeah. So they'll finish top and probably assume that they'll play Tyrone. They'll avoid they Dublin, yeah, yeah, to the final. So they have. And Kerry that. probably would want to avoid. That. That's, yeah. that, that's kind of presuming that. Yeah, Dublin sure they, beat Tyrone. Yeah, yeah. they'll presume Dublin beat Tyrone, so they'll want to finish top. Yeah. Well, well I think Dublin them. beat Tyrone with their first team, and I think if they go B team, you don't think that'll happen. Dublin's B team's better than Tyrone's B team, yeah. so you know, I, th- I, I think Dublin are definitely going to win that. So, what do you think? Do you think the seven handicap is under threat here, or do you think um, do you think Mead can get keep it inside seven? No, I think it's going to be a. It's going to be a tough day for me. Over seven, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's win and a half by four points and four points, which yeah, is yeah. you know well doable for just Kerry. Just the forwards, and the form they're in, like likes of Stephen O'Brien, who I know has been there a few years, but he just looks phenomenally sure. He has done for a number of years. Yeah. He's actually very underrated. Very underrated. Yeah, he's a phenomenal footballer. Yeah, um, and has been for the last four or five years. He seems to be chipping in with a few more scores now, maybe, and he has it. But the, just the speed of him, he's so dangerous. The speed of him and the directness of him. Like when he gets the ball in his hands, you're not getting it off him. He's just so strong. Um, right, Cork Roscommon. Cork are eight to fifteen. Roscommon fifteen to eight. Fancy a high scoring game here. This is a weird one in that this is a bit like a league game. I know they'll say they're both out. They both want to win it to um, obviously have something to build on next year and say we won one Super Eight game. Cork, you would say, have performed very well in the Super Eights. Um, they were excellent against Dublin for most of that game and did, absolutely didn't deserve to lose by thirteen. They were excellent against Tyrone for most of the game. Roscommon good against Tyrone, blown away by Dublin. Um, I fancy Cork um, here, but I fancy this to be a very open game, almost like an exhibition game. You know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose. It's like, like the chance for lads to go out and kind of enjoy themselves in it like this. And that's, that, that's kind of the only way you could look upon it, go out and give a good hard performance. But, but just enjoy it. And I think yeah. it will be an open game. But they'll both Cork will good, I think. Like... Yeah, like I think Cork will win. I think with an open game with the likes of Hurley up front, who's who's been in pretty decent form, and if he gets a bit of space, he can do a lot of damage. And just don't think Ross Common have really anyone at his level. Yeah, no. Well, I suppose they have. Um, they have. Oh, Cox. His name? Cox. Yes, yeah. geez, his name has gone out of my head. They have Cox and Murta inside who who aren't bad, but at the same time, I think Cork probably have a bit more. But I think both teams will probably put a little bit into this game in that two points in the Super Eights. Do you know what I mean? We didn't finish last. You know what I mean? We're one point off Tyrone, which will probably lose to Dublin. You know, they can mm-hmm. they can maybe re Cork could probably really build on getting those two points. I think so, yeah. Like and they won't want so many hard luck stories, but did well against Kerry, did well against yeah. Dublin, did well against Tyrone, and then if they can win this game, there they'll, you go. They'll know that they stepped up, yeah. They're up a level. Like and they're under twenty one under twenties are in the final against uh Dublin this weekend. Yeah. So like I mean, you know, they really have stuff psychologically that they can build on. So yeah. I think the win is probably more important to Cork, Cork right? Yeah. The only disappointment for them thing is that they're going to be in Division 3 next year, aren't they? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. Like that's yeah. going to be, they're coming back into that next year. Like if they were, like if they'd have stayed in Division 2 and they kind of had that Division 1 to aim for next year, it would have been like another great stepping stone for them. Whereas I think it's, it, 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 uh, just going to Division 3 next year just takes a little bit of the gloss off what mm. they've done over the last yeah. over the last couple of months. Yeah, no, definitely for the winter training. Um, right, so we'll just finish up with predictions on Mayo Donegal. Lads. I can't believe Paddy Power have this Mayo 13-8, to 8, Donegal 4-6. to 6. Mayo... Um, outsiders I have this a 50-50 game I really do I think the home advantage definitely brings while you'd say Donegal slight favourites you'd say the home advantage plus Jason McGee you'd say is almost certainly out limped off with a hamstring injury against Kerry he's gone McBrearty there's big big talk over McBrearty being out that he Keen Ward said on this show that he did his hamstring towards the end of that my information is that that wasn't too bad but he's done it since However, how much truth is that? And then on the other side, you have Higgins, Durkin and O'Connor all back in contention. I think Ruan might be a little bit uh, far away for this one, but you wouldn't be surprised if he's needed to come on. This has to be a 50-50 yeah. game, lads, no? Uh, for me it is, yeah, but I think that the, and it hasn't been spoken about much. The, the, uh, the little side twist on this is Rochford. Stephen Rochford. Yeah. Like, 
Um, he'll gonna, know those it's players gonna be, inside it's out. It's going to be a funny day for him. Now. Well, here, yeah, here's, the, here's the other thing I wanted to ask you on that, not to cut you off. He'll know the Mayo players inside out. I know the Mayo players inside out. Do you know what I mean? Like I know he'll. Yeah, what what will he know? Give? What will yeah, he know yeah. that we've, this team's on the road so long and the team hasn't changed that much? What will he give the Donegal lads? Do you think? Ah, I don't think that, like well, James Horn is going to play like, like we're going to play the game the way he wants to play it. So I don't think there's much in terms of well, maybe a small little nu- little nuances with players. But like yeah, he I doesn't he doesn't like being t- when players take him on or he doesn't like being marked from the front yeah. or he, he, they might know a little stuff that they like and yeah he, yeah and I don't think he'd be disrespectful about it but obviously. He has to do a professional job for Donegal, but I think it'd be interesting as a Donegal player to hear him talking, which I'm sure he does talk at talk at meetings or whatever, because he seems to be he seems to be the right hand man out this stage. Him and Carl Lacey alongside Declan Bonner. Um, so so as a Donegal player, it'd be interesting to hear Stephen Rochford talk about. Um, and I think even that will give the Donegal players a little bit of an edge and thinking that right, we have a like we have something here to hang on to. And, yeah. and yeah, like I fancy if McBrady's out. He, like he's a massive, massive loss. I think if Roberti's fit and that's here, so I'd be surprised if he was if he hurt his hamstring that he was back. Like that's only that's only ten days ago. So would he be trained again so close? Yeah, but she only needs a hamstring. But she um, only needs to just do it and kicking a ball maybe or something. Ball, maybe, yeah, so he'd be a massive loss. I think if Roberti plays, then you got win it. If Roberti's out, my own. Right. Okay. Is that he's that important? Here's I was thinking maybe Rochford helps him out. Like I mean, he'd know all their GPS stats, for example. He'd know all that inside. Say Seamus O'Shea is just back. Lads, his GPS fall off a cliff. Let's change. Let's make a substitution and run him. You know, yeah. he, I, 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 I'm trying to think what he would be able to give them because like he would have a lo- he actually would have a lot of information. Yeah, and you know sort of yeah when players are going to wane during games and stuff like that. Yeah, that's actually an interesting one and. When you go back to the the Mees Donegal game, and I don't blame Seamus O'Shea at all, but Donald Coogan just lined him up and, and rinsed him, went past him and went in for a goal, should have scored. But Mayo need to be careful. They avoid those little mismatches happening around the pitch, but I don't know if they can the way they play because they're so, they're so gung-ho. It's almost kamikaze. Everybody just streams forward and then everybody works hard to get back. And I think that's where Rochford could come in handy then, is trying to sort of develop those mismatches around the pitch. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, just a, the final question on this is whether Donegal play a counter-attack game like they did against Tyrone or whether they go all-out football like they did against Kerry. They know that football game is what Mayo would like to play. Mayo don't like playing against defensive counter-attacking teams. I just don't know whether what Donegal will be planning on doing this weekend. Yeah, like it, it's, it's like losing the likes of Owen Bott. Oh, oh, Bon Gallagher ch- yeah, probably changes loss, things yeah. slightly for for. Uh, well, it didn't against Kerry. He still he well. still played that football. He played like the football they played against Kerry was I couldn't believe it. The amount of fo- like they didn't play a defensive style against Kerry at all. Like mm. I mean, and that's with Kerry's forward line. I I couldn't believe what I was watching. The point of the matter is, the great thing about Donegal, nobody knows what they're coming with now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they have yeah, that. They can like, play it either way. They can yeah. play it either way at this stage and. But it's a different game, and like it's a different game in Castlebar compared to Crow Park. Even though the pitches might be similar size, like the ball doesn't doesn't run as freely, the crowd is a bit closer. So you know yourself when you go to provincial grounds, it's like it's just different to Crow Park. So the same sort of space won't be there anyway to play that expansive game that they played against Kerry. Um, yeah, look, I'd expect them to mix it up a little bit. Like they're a very experienced team at this stage, and they have the they have the experience that that, that they can mix it up if they have to. And and that's why I just. I, like I just think Donegal are a little bit more controlled than Mayo. You say like mm. going to Mayo, it's all it's all or nothing. Whereas I think it just seems to be a little bit more control about the Donegal thing. Okay, you're going for Donegal. I'm going for Donegal. You're yeah, going for Donegal. I'm going for Donegal to go through, so either a draw or uh, or a win. So I'm sort of hedging my bets. On okay, that. I'm going for Mayo. Like I think that the uh, the home advantage, the lads back, and I think the McBrearty thing is massive, if that's the case. And you know, like I mean. It's a 50-50 game and you just slightly side um, with Mayo on that. But anyways, that's it. Right, we're in Westport, like I said last night. We'll see you all there. Loads of tickets um, have been sold, so we'll look forward to seeing you all there. Um, we have a great lineup, And after that, then we'll be back on Monday, Bank Holiday, and we'll review the whole weekend. So we'll talk to you then. Good luck. <laughs>